Hey folks, Dave Nodding, financial futurist here at Vetify. I've been curious about what's been going on in the Canadian market, honestly, my whole career. And anytime I get the chance, I sit down with Dan Strauss and his team at National Bank Financial. We get into a really interesting conversation about the differences between the US and Canadian approaches from a cultural perspective, from a regulatory perspective. We talk about covered call writing and thematics and crypto and cannabis and all of the various things that have come first to Canada and may then show up in the United States. I think it's a fascinating conversation. I think it gives us an interesting window onto what our future may be here in the US. We even close with a few music recommendations. I hope you enjoy it. Cheers. What do you think we can learn from each other. I've always learned a lot from what y'all are doing up, up here. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you seem to be way ahead on a bunch of stuff. Crypto, asset allocation product, tra non transparent active. We could go through a long list. Right. Yeah, the first um, ETF. The first ETF, I mean, it's, it's a very long list. Yeah. What do you feel right now are the biggest learning points we could go back and forth on? I think I, it strips down to culture. Right. I think that that is one of the key differences between Canada and the U.S. And I think right. that if uh, you'll find some observers who quibble, there's a big American monoculture, Hollywood, Wall Street. It's swallowing the world. But uh, Canada, you know, despite being very close, you know, yeah. to the United States, closest uh, northern neighbor, longest unprotected uh, border in the world. <laughs> uh, culturally, there are still some differences between Wall Street and Bay Street, which is just down the street right down over there. there yeah. Right. Um, and I think that. It's that kind of cultural difference that makes Canadians Canadians, that it makes our ETF in industry apart from what uh, you, know, you might observe in the entire financial services sector well, in the so US. Well, what, so what is that cultural difference? Sure. Like, what is it that makes the Canadian market right. different and uniquely Canadian? Okay, so one is that it's small, right? It's, a, it's got more of that small town feel. Canada is one-tenth the size of the United States, population-wise, GDP-wise. Uh, more land mass, which means way less density in terms of uh, population and uh, harder to connect things infrastructure wise. So, um, and, you know, historically Canadians as a result have been, uh, you know, there's an element of that in American culture as well, that kind of like frontier individual attitude, right? right. right? Certainly in the uh, American West. Exactly. Right? There's a lot you know, of mythology so, around that. Precisely. Yeah. You know, so, so I think that within Canada, th there is more of a kind of a relationship business here uh, on, on, uh, on Bay Street. And I think the ETF market exemplifies that. Uh, uh, for instance, in the United States, Dave, perhaps you could tell me this. How many APs, authorized participants, does an ETF need to have uh, in order to, to function and list? Yeah, it's like four, right. probably minimum. Right, right. So, like, say, but more than one, right? More than uh, one. The probably idea more than one. To ensure yeah. a fair market and arm's length dealing and so on and so forth. Whereas in Canada, I think that, you know, most ETFs do have more than one. Uh, they're called market makers here. Uh, there's one who's usually a designated broker. But those strict rules that ensure fair play and fair dealing aren't as prevalent in Canada. In some way they were less handcuffed to try uh, and do interesting things. As a result, active ETFs can flourish here, many different kinds of strategies. Uh, but uh, in the US, I think that uh, the rules for there to be you know, minimum three APs or certainly more than one, it's a good rule because it ensures uh, that everyone is watching each other's backs. The competitive mechanism ensures uh, liquidity, that costs are driven down to their marginal level in the United States. In Canada, um, there, there's more trust. And because right. there's more trust, um, newer things can be tried. Some of that has to be the relationship with regulators, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked many times about sort of the Ontario Securities Commission being a little bit more forward thinking than our Securities and Exchange right. Commission. Yeah. Um, but it, it seems to go both ways. Not only do you get to try more things here, mm -hmm. but it also seems like the hammer comes down pretty quick. We've had some experience with this lately. Right, We've had yeah. a, an issuer that's, that's sort right. of been told they can't trade anymore yeah. because mostly it seems procedural issues under right. the hood. Yeah. Is that, do you feel like that's a typical way that you're interacting with the regulators? A lot of room up front, but mm -hmm. also a lot of paying attention to that's what's right. really going on. Yeah, yeah. I think that because of the scale, we talked about the scale, right? Because Canada's smaller, a smaller market, um, and its regulatory body, I think, is probably smaller if you were even proportionally. I don't know. I would love to be able to check how many SEC enforcement officers are, are there <laughs> relative to OSC and does it scale per, with per population, dollar. right? Yeah. Exactly. I have a feeling it's smaller in Canada because the SEC, you know, for better or for worse, and perhaps rightfully actually, sees itself as the world's financial cop, right? right? Um, and, uh, and, and they see the integrity of capital markets in general as part of their mission and mandate, whereas Canada's 
regulators are, are happy for a, a small kind of hotbed of experimentation to emerge here, and they will watch it grow in situ and, and push and pull and collaborate with it to ensure that innovation isn't stifled and so on. The first ETF came to Canada despite having been filed first, I think, in the U.S. This is a, this horse race is something that I know is very controversial amongst yeah, yeah. Uh, my uh, American ETF analyst counterparts. And yes, Canada got the first launch, but we got the first filing, and because our regulators were slow and dragged their feet for four years, XIU, at the end, it was now, it's now XIU beats spy to market, right. right? Whereas in Canada, we looked uh, south of the board and said, hey, this filing with Amex looks interesting. Let's just do it, <laughs> right? Uh, that's what ended up happening here, and I think there's been many examples of that. We can, we're, we can be more nimble because we're smaller, right? right? And that has pros and cons. So what, what do you feel like, the, if there's anything, right. you feel like there's anything in the ETF market that the U.S. is getting right that Canada could, Canada could learn mm. from? Because for me, it always feels very one way. I think for a lot of American investors, right. they're surprised by that. But right, what, right. what about mm. how we do business in the U.S. more broadly in sort of the wealth management space? Right. How do you think we can translate some of that up here? So I would say that there is, uh, and, and this is going to get wonky and into the weeds, and I hope we're you're comfortable with it because, it. you know, all right, here we go. Uh, the, it's the ETF taxation, right? The, the heartbeat trades, the, allow, the, the mechanism by which U.S. ETFs can push out low-cost-based shares via redemption, right? This allows U.S. ETFs to be very tax efficient. For my entire career in Canada, I have talked about ETFs as being low in cost, uh, ultra-transparent, um, uh, very efficient, diversified, but there's a little fifth bullet point that they get as part of their selling feature in the United States, and that's tax efficient, that. right? They're tax efficient in some ways, um, but the main form of tax efficiency that you'll find in the United States, which is that they rarely pay capital gains, that we don't, we don't have the same avenues available to us to kind of ratchet up cost base internal to a fund. Just because you Canada. don't have that Supreme Court case saying you could do in kind of right. property without yeah. it being a transaction. And, and, and maybe yeah. it's also just an accident of the fact that we do something called average cost base accounting. It's, right. uh, you know, uh, who, and, and as a result, ETFs and mutual funds are a bit more of an equal footing here. That said, ETFs are still growing at a, va a very rapid clip. Every mutual fund company is launching. Every bank is launching. So uh, I, w I would love it if, um, you know, Canadian regulators, for instance, were to look at uh, the, the clear advantages on tax deferral. We're not talking tax avoidance, tax deferral that is available to U.S. ETF investors. For, from doing the in-kinding. That's right. But, but it, that has had another effect in the Canadian market, right. which is far more of that primary market activity happens in cash. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., the vast majority of creation redemption happens in-kind. That's right. Precisely because of these tax advantages. That's in right. fact, I just did this thing with our friend Elizabeth Kashner at right. FactSet where we were talking about heartbeat trading and yeah. perhaps we do a little too much of that, right? Yeah. More than we I love should it. get away with. Yeah. Um, so like that, yeah. that, that tax structure has instead made Canada in some ways more efficient because that mm. cash create redeem That's process. Right. Yeah is just inherently easier for market makers to deal with. It's easier for market makers to deal with, and it enables active management to a degree and scale that doesn't exist in the United States. Because you don't have uh, to worry about what the basket is. Precisely. Right. You know, the, mar the ETF uh, market maker, and, uh, and I hope you get a chance to meet a few of them while you're here uh, on your visit, uh, they still need to hedge. They right. still need to cover their risk. So having an inkling of the basket is certainly important to them. You know, um, and uh, whatever missing information they have will translate into bid ask spreads. But they can do cash creation and redemption all day, every day. Right. And that enables uh, what I think is now called semi-transparent active in the United States. It's been here in Canada we for a long time. We can't decide what we're calling it. Exactly. What is active, exactly? non-transparent. That's right. You know, whatever, semi-transparent, yeah, whatever we call right. it. That's right, yeah. Which hasn't been um, a, quite the, the bulwark for assets mm -hmm. in an active management space that I think folks were hoping. I think a lot of fund companies were hoping that a non-transparent structure would allow them to sort of play defense right. and hold on to some assets. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure it's really worked out that way. We've mm. got some great examples of funds that have sure. done really well in right. that structure, but it hasn't been a flood of, of lots of offerings. But in Canada, it seems like active is really firmly in 20, 25% of AUM. You right. know, I think that number, it's, it's not the majority, but it's a, it's a good chunk, certainly higher than the United States, although the U.S. is growing. I know I've been doing this for 13 years now, uh, approximately, and uh, when I started, active no. in the U.S. was yeah. sub 1%. Yeah. I think maybe PIMCO was in it uh, a little bit with a particularly popular bond fund. That was it. 
Then Kathy Wood and ARK came on the scene. Active seemed to explode. You've got a whole bunch of mutual fund conversions happening now. So it seems like in the U.S., the, the active conversation, there's, a, there's some percolation happening in the ETF industry, and it will be interesting to see where, where it takes a root. In Canada, it was always part of uh, the conversation. You know, Horizons Alpha Pro was their brand for specifically introducing active managers and ETF service provision, kind of closing the loop there. It's been very, very early. Uh, BMO has a whole suite of dividend and ETFs, for instance, we consider them active because they don't track an index. They track a, a, a quantitative black box inside, right. you know, BMO's um, desk there. But, uh, you know, and they'll, they'll explain the rules to us, but we still consider it active because they do have discretion no, course, about when they, when they rebalance. Covered call ETFs, that's another example where sometimes the basket of stocks on which the option manager is writing calls, uh, that basket will be as passive as could be. But then the option strategy is active. Uh, and it's good that it's active because uh, if you follow an index methodology with a covered call overlay, then you may seriously be, uh, you know, robotically capping your upside right when you don't want to. If there's been a big sell-off, uh, we observed it. We observed it in real time. In March 2020, uh, you had the COVID sell-off. I think you had the steepest and fastest kind of V-shaped recovery in certain pockets of the market. And I think it didn't happen across every option ETF in Canada, every covered call ETF, but many of them. Uh, reduce their coverage uh, uh, overwriting. They brought out their strike prices a little bit at that at the bottom because you know when when prices fall by twenty thirty percent that much that right. fast. Perhaps if you're an active manager, you don't want to strike your new well, options. Well, you know right in those moments that the prices are wrong. That's so right. Whatever the prices are, exactly. they're not correct right. because everybody's working with incomplete information. That's right. Yeah. Things are moving too fast. Right, and so right. in that environment, active yeah. really pans out. That's right. Have they been rewarded for that? Like, were funds that were a little more active in that right. period outperforming? Yeah. The, that, uh, we are finding a wealth of evidence in terms of just the variety of option strategies that are on the street. We have a giant uh, selection of covered call ETFs for almost every industrial sector, every global area, you know, uh, and now even in the US, iShares, I think, has launched covered call fixed income ETFs, yep. right? Um, I know for a long time in the US there were CBOE buy right ETNs that yep. were out for a long time. Which and were all very passive. They right? were very passive, right. and their performance, I think, probably soured a lot of people on the very concept of covered call uh, ETFs. Huge growth area in Canada because Canadians, and this is maybe one of our cultural differences, they love their yield. Right. Talk to a behavioral scientist, talk to uh, any economist and the difference between yield and total returns. One, I mean, absent taxation and so on, you want to be indifferent. Be, right. right yeah. You can synthesize your own real, just monetize your portfolio. A call overlay is essentially doing that in a probabilistic way. Right. You can synthesize a call option with a combination of stocks and bonds and so on that you're kind of dynamically tuning with Delta every day. And, uh, you know, so covered call ETFs do essentially, in a way, monetize the portfolio. So do they outperform? They don't under outperform benchmarks when benchmarks have, uh, uh, you know, strong uptrending periods. Right. Exactly. Right? right. But which ones outperform each other? Do they give higher yields? Yes. Do the ones with very active management styles uh, tend to do better? Well, it depends on how much is their coverage. Is it 50 percent? Is it 30 percent? This is the thing that ETF, being an ETF analyst is so exciting. All this data is available to us, right. right? We can talk to the providers. We can look on their websites. We can see very transparently all the different kinds of strategies that are out there. And our mandate as the ETF analyst uh, team, and we're a full-time team of four, uh, sometimes five if we're lucky enough to have a summer intern uh, you know, here at National Bank, uh, we, we, our job is to collect all this data and present it to clients, present it to investment advisors uh, that we work with, institutional clients as well who trade with our trading desk, and say, here, let us educate you. Look at how the different products behave. Look at how they uh, work in a, both a stated and unstated manner. And then you can, you're more empowered to make your decision. So that hunt for yield, mm -hmm. it may be particularly Canadian it culturally. Is, yeah. The, the that that phrase, the hunt for yield, mm. has still been on the head of every financial publication in the United States for the last five right. years. Right, yeah. that hunt for yield does seem somewhat universal. Right. Um, now that we have more competition for mm -hmm. yield products, right, yeah. you can get yield from doing something other than just selling volatility right. on your equity portfolio. Um, we've got companies paying good dividends. We've got a live rates market for the first time in the last twenty yep. years. Yeah, that's right. um, you know, in Canada, you have a particular sets of products that five percent, five percent yields. Yeah. So. Has that changed that mix? Does that yeah. put a little bit of a damper on the desire to yieldify their equity? Right, and right. A little more focused yeah, on just buying yield products? Yeah, yeah. Well, for so long, rates were effectively yeah. zero, right? Um, and uh, 
Uh, it is interesting. I wonder if part of this kind of cultural hunt for yield is a bit of a holdover from this kind of post-crisis period where we had this ZERP world, this zero interest rate policy world. It seemed like that was the new normal, right, for a long time. I think it was Bill Gross who uh, coined that yeah, term, yeah. right, uh, talking about the ultra low rate bond environment that was emerging uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Even though rates are going and we're in the fastest hiking cycle we've ever seen, I think people still think that uh, yield is precious, uh, right. that it's uh, and and that one should take advantage of our opportunities when one sees them. You know, my only concern is that um, there, there is a practice amongst, you know, a certain generation of investors, perhaps those who are just getting into it, uh, especially if they want yield, they'll look at the big list of ETFs on a third-party data provider on a website. Sort by yield. That's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. what I was going to say. They'll sort by yield and they'll take the top one. Now, if you did that in the world of stocks, I think most people understand that the stocks you find at the top of that list are... You know, you've, you've got to just got cut in half. That's for right. Some you've, reason. you've got to yeah. sign a bargain with your soul yeah. or so, something <laughs> like that to, to, to invest in those. Now, yeah. if you do that with ETFs, does that same rule hold true? Not if there's an option overlay in there, right? It does. It means something else. It means something different. It means yeah. something different. Exactly. And, right. and is it a right thing or a wrong thing to go after that high yield? Depends what your goals are. And that's what our research helps to help people figure out. My vibe on Canada is that the retail market is a little bit more strongly penetrated here than the mm. U.S. I know it's hard to prove this with ETFs, yeah. but certainly if you look at trading volumes, right. um, it seems like retail is a bigger force here in Canada. Certainly mm. um, the covered call products and asset allocation products, mm -hmm. two areas that right. are very right. anemic in the United States, yep. are very traditionally big retail products here. Yep. What can we learn about how investors are service, right? Mm. The, the banking model here has been this way forever, right? right. Six big banks own yeah. the world. That's right. The United States seems to be heading in somewhat that direction. Every yeah. time we have a banking crisis, we end up with a lot fewer banks. Right. What do you think we can learn from that kind of oligopoly of mm. banking? Is there something mm. positive about it that sure. we can take away that you know ETF issuers in the US yeah. or ETF investors in the US could be thinking about? Yeah, okay. two or three things immediately come to mind, right? One is, what is the explanatory force behind why the Canadian ETF market proportionally is more retail oriented? And I think it's because our local institutional market can go play in the U.S. ETF market if they need SPY exposure, EFI exposure, uh, global bonds. The U.S. ETF market is the biggest, uh, burliest in the world. Uh, you've got uh, juggernaut ETFs there that themselves almost dwarf our entire industry, right? right? Um, and an institution that can take care of its own uh, currency hedging and is fighting over the last basis point in terms of MER and fee it's almost impossible to compete with that, right? right? So not only can Canadian institutions go invest in the US ETF market, but Canadian retail investors can as well. We have met many Canadians, average Canadians, who go and they buy US ETFs. Now, I don't know if this is a symmetrical situation. I think in one of your uh, uh, previous uh, interviews, you probably talked about uh, some of the regulatory uh, well, laxity that has allowed that. It doesn't work the other way, right. right? So if I'm a US investor, it's actually quite difficult for me to get access to mm. Canadian ETFs. So if the retail investor can get access to the U.S., then mm -hmm. what is it about the Canadian ETF market that's keeping them here? Right. Well, so many things. Uh, one is that uh, the providers here have very close relationships with, with their investors. All of the six banks are providers now. Right. And I'm glad you said six, because sometimes people say the big five and a national bank we our feelings get a little hurt, when, and, and that's right. We like I, I like to say that Can National Bank is Canada's sixth largest bank out of six. Uh, but you know, we, we very much punch above our weight when it comes to ETFs. We have our research desk and our market making team, and so on. It, it is amazing. Every bank here has its niche. Uh, you know, it it and and to your point about the Canadian banking industry being just these six banks, and there there's some smaller regional players. Uh, which are often in danger of getting bought up and acquired yeah. and so on. But then the regulators <laughs> say, hold on, yeah, yeah, you know, like, you know, so that's, a, that's definitely part of the dynamic here. Uh, but I think that their brands and their kind of street presence the, uh, with average investors is high enough that um, people are comforted, I think, to know that they've got a relationship with the ETF provider, uh, uh, even if it is a non-bank player, like your iShares and Vanguards and Horizons of the world. They're, they're very act, uh, active and hungry, and then they go on the, on the street and they present to advisors' offices all the time. You know, so um, the, 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 I think that that's something that uh, would be interesting to see if the lesson could be um, 
port it over to, to the United States. Yeah, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, there's some, some value in understanding that the geography of Canada mm. actually has a big impact here. Mm -hmm. The wealth is very concentrated. I, yeah, the wealth yeah. is not in the fields of Manitoba. I well, mean, it is notionally. Right, but right, right. In terms of the it, person that you wealth need concentrates to see. in Winnipeg. Yeah, that's about to say. It's like, it's <laughs> yeah. going to end up in one of the capital cities. That's right. For sure. Yeah. Which means that if you're an issuer here and you need a wholesaler, like, right. It's a yeah. week of plane trips. Right. We complain yeah. all the time about our worst cell phone plans in the right. world and, and you know our wireless costs and internet and all that kind of like technology and data infrastructure. Look how big <laughs> that our distances are, you yeah. know? Uh, that, that explains part of it, but it does, uh, it does also mean that uh, you know, to, to be hyper-local in Canada is extremely helpful. You know, the, the local communities and so on, uh, they have their own cultures, as we talked about, their own means and the ways of investing, and that applies to even different neighborhoods of Toronto. So, so in thinking about that relationship with banks, you know, the banks have become that primary financial partner right. for most Canadian citizens. That's right. Um, but there isn't that sense that I get from Canadians that they actually care. Mm. Like people in Canada actually seem to care who their bank is. They do, and and they not only do they like their banks, but they like their bank ETFs, right? Yeah. Some of the biggest and most popular and most actively traded ETFs in Canada are the big six bank ETFs. And there's various flavors. There are some that are equal weight. There are some that are yield weighted. <laughs> there are some that are momentum weighted. Some, I'm I think, sure some have you know, options. Some are, exactly. <laughs> and those are very popular right. too. You know, banks uh, give you exposure to the Canadian economy. It's a resource economy, right? So uh, even though it's in the financial sector, uh, when demand for oil goes up and raw materials and so on, the banks do well, right? Uh, it could be part of the strange reason that even things like emerging market investing isn't as big here as you would otherwise think because Canadian, the Canadian domestic market is a bit correlated to the emerging markets as well. As their fortunes rise, the demand for our exports goes up and, our, and we're kind of coupled in that uh, way. Interesting. You I know? never thought about it that yeah. way. One of the things that's changed in the U.S. that's been really interesting is mm. as the rate market has come up and, mm -hmm. and you know, it makes sense to think about putting money into bonds again for the first time in a long time, that whole part of the ETF market just exploded with product development. Yeah. Um, and yeah. enormous flows, like mm -hmm. first quarter in particular this year, right. just massive dominance on fixed mm -hmm. income flows, mm -hmm. which was a very late entry to the ETF market in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even have fixed income products until the 2000s. Right. First um, fixed income ETF ever launched in Canada. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to just put a list up here? That's right. Like, no. Check, check, That's right. check. Yeah. Currency like, hedging. Do you get like a bonus if you That's mention a big, every single thing? I wish. Thing that would be so nice. <laughs> Currency hedging, crypto, you name That's it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Active, Cannabis. I get it. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, after Canada figured it out, That's right. we then decided that we cared about bonds again. That's right. Um, and then we had this explosion in product. Yeah. A tremendous amount of it focused at the very short end of the mm -hmm. curve. That I'm sure has been the same case here. What's unique, uh, other than the high interest savings account, right. which I've talked about many yeah. times, um, have you seen that same kind of interest in just sort of global bond portfolios, mm. you know, six yeah. to 12 month treasury, right, that right. kind of stuff? So this is interesting, and it depends on how you tease apart the data. We have to make adjustments because of the enormous popularity of the multi-asset ETFs, the asset allocation portfolio right. ETFs. Another big difference between Canada and the U.S. And I think between, uh, it, it harkens right back to what you were saying about our more retail-oriented market. Retail um, investors love these multi-asset ETFs, your 60-40 portfolios, right? As soon as a suite of them came to Canada and Vanguard, you know, we give them a lot of credit for this. They kind of blew the category open when they put their own ETF of ETFs at a very, very low cost, very low bundling right. fee. And these were already cheap ETFs. And so people started buying them hand over fist through their discount channels or their self-directed investment and with channels. the idea that that's just one ticker trading is exactly. easier than building it yourself. Set it and Got forget it. it. Exactly, right? Um, and uh, uh, the funny thing about that was they launched a conservative balanced and um, growth version, right? Which was like 40-60, 60-40, uh, then 80-20, right? And the demand for the higher risk was, uh, was clearly present, right? The, the growth uh, version of these multi-asset ETFs were getting more flows every month than the balance, which was getting more flows than the conservative. And I said, if you look at this pattern, if you just launch a 100-0, that'll get even more <laughs> assets, right? And I said it as a joke, right? right. A 100-0 portfolio is an all-equity portfolio. Equity, it's right? not yeah. a multi-asset portfolio. But they did launch it, and it sold oh, very you well. Be kidding. And I said, okay, all right. Um, I think it's hysterical that you can call a 100% equity portfolio an asset allocation. Right, product. right. <laughs> it, we have to put it in there. It has kind of like the same right. kind of ticker series. 
Uh, and interestingly, such ETFs have existed forever. They're called the MSCI World Index. Yeah, no, I right? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's uh, just a regular but, that, uh, but what's the weight of, the, of Canada in the MSCI World Index? Yeah, it's I like don't know. 3%, Small. 5%. Yeah. It's single digit percentage right. point at any rate. But most Canadians, if they want like a multi asset, all equity portfolio that's 100% equities, and what should be my bond weight? Oh, yeah, zero. They still want a little more than 5% Canada. Yeah, they still want to have. So big those chunks. ETFs, they're different from the, the kind of world equity index ETFs in that the 25, 30% weight is in. Canada. Oh, so they bank in a little home bias. That's right. A little home okay. bias, which that is. That makes sense. It that's makes not... sense. You know, you, you could argue academically as to whether that's the right or wrong thing to do. Sure. But right. I think that yeah. uh, most Canadians understand that they earn in Canada, they spend in Canada. It is more efficient from a tax perspective to hold Canadian dividend paying stocks than global stocks. You get taxed as foreign income, your highest marginal tax right. rate on foreign dis dividends. Whereas Canadian companies, there are some tax breaks available to what are called eligible dividends. And I don't that know. And passes through. That's right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there is there is a reason to uh, overweight Canada that's very rational, you know? So these ETFs, it makes perfect sense to me that for a very aggressive, growth-minded, all equity style investors, why they've been successful as well. Are there any other corners where that mm. kind of tax arbitrage is is kind of the hidden story under the hood? Certainly in the U.S., yeah. plenty of cases where people are really leaning on the tax efficiency of the ETF right. vehicle. Right. Right. Some people argue a little bit yeah. too much right. Right. because you don't have that available. Mm. Um, is there anything else other than that sort yeah. of Canadian dividend treatment? Well, that I'll say this is one area where Canadian regulators have perhaps not been as collaborative as they could have been, you know, and if any of them are watching, I really hope that <laughs> because in the spirit of collaboration, you know, and good ideas yeah. and sharing, we can we can talk about this freely and candidly, you yeah. know, and that is uh, around the many interventions that the Canadian federal budget has done over the years kind of targeting the asset management industry. You know, in, in, in 2019, there was a, a, a budget overhaul that uh, forbade what's called allocation to redeemers that made Canadian ETFs uh, not only kind of more expensive on a tax, uh, uh, from a tax perspective, but more, uh, more burdensome involving like some kind of record keeping and calculations they had to do as well. Uh, in 2016, the mutual fund corporation, some of its properties were kind of axed. Uh, there, there have been times again and again and again when, and this comes from the Ministry of Finance, not necessarily our, our regulators, uh, where, you know, the, the asset management industry has kind of come in, uh, under the crosshairs of well-meaning public servants who want to, you know, do do more for revenue collection, yeah. for lack of a better term, in, in Canada. And by targeting the asset management industry, it seems, like, who knows, maybe they're going after fat cats. They're not going after fat cats. They're right. going after regular people. Regular savers. You know, who's, yeah. who's exactly, yeah. or trying to do right by their families and so on. So this is something that has happened uh, in Canada again and again. The That that does seem universal, because that comes up all the time right. with ETFs, yeah. but with a, particularly around in-kind redemption, like whether right. or not we should get rid of that, That's right. how much money would be collected, Collected, yeah. you know, it's small B billions, which yeah. sounds like a lot of money right, to right. people in Washington. It's right, you know, right. de minimis in terms of. Um, no, I, I, I think that the position around this, I think that I've seen expressed the best is yours, Dave, in which you say the taxation treatment within a mutual fund. That's kind of bonkers. Who would decide that? Yeah. Why should leftover long-term remaining unit holders be on the hook for the kind of high-speed trading activity right. of people who've entered and exited mm -hmm. without? any participation on my part, right? Right. So that's kind of what ends up happening in more inefficient fund structures, just because of that's how it was convenient, record keeping wise and so on, right? Uh, and we don't think of that as fair, we just think of that as an accident of history, right? ETFs are more efficient than that in the United States. So do they need to, uh, do we need to kind of trim those tall poppies to bring them onto a level playing field with inefficient mutual funds? Or should we think about it differently and, and you know, helping uh, savers and investors uh, achieve their goals differently. That's what's, my view. What's, what's got you excited? Like, what mm. do you think's coming down the pike here that is new, innovative, interesting? Like, what are you excited to write about? Whether it's a pro or a con, right, what's right. interesting yeah. that you think is in the works? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I love writing about the thematic ETFs and yeah, talking about thematics, them and so yeah. on. I gave a talk recently entitled, uh, uh, you know, New Lessons from the Retro Future, what the future of the past tells about the present of investing. I got to dig into all my science fiction and stuff like that because there's ETFs out there now for almost every science fiction theme. Yeah, AI, about. space, you name it. Yeah. Exactly, right? So now whether or not these are sound investment theses is up for debate. But at least the existence of the ETFs lets us track it, lets us have a convenient basket of the company. We can now judge which ones offer you more pure or less pure exposure 
to that kind of theme. One of the criticisms of thematics is that you are effectively buying headlines, right? Yeah. So you're, if you're buying a cannabis ETF, you're not really buying an economic sector. You're buying just you know the ability for something to pop on a headline. Mm. The other flip side is most of these themes have in common the difficulty of making a pure play portfolio, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In some cases, like a Canadian cannabis ETF, a little bit easier because there are actually mm. some companies that right, you can just right. say that Been that's all they do. Yeah. yeah, so there's like, that's a little bit more developed. Yeah. But when we talk about something like AI, mm. right, which is obviously the topic of the day for a right. lot of people, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what are you going to do? Buy more Meta and more Google and more that's NVIDIA right. and more yeah. TSMC? Like, that's what right. do you do in that? That's right. Are you really getting that? Or are you just paying yeah. a yeah. higher fee for a theme? What are your thoughts there? Right. So a lot of thoughts. One is that what's the primary benefit of ETFs? What are one of the one of what is one of the halos that hang over the heads of their kind of Boy Scout image? It's the diversification right. element, right? Um, you have already a lot of people who like to play on headlines, and they play on headlines by buying single stocks, and especially in the spaces that are emergent like cannabis and whatnot. Um, some of those stocks may not even be around in a, in a couple of months. This is the the chief risk of equity investing is is if you hold a stock, if you're an equity shareholder, your money may go away. Right. Right. Yeah, that's, theoretically. That you deserve to be rewarded for bearing that risk. Suites. That's yeah. right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's what equity risk means. Yeah. You're a cork bobbing on the ocean and the ocean might drain away. Right. Right. And then you're, you got nothing. Right. There, there's fascinating images in the fi in financial history on, uh, you know, uh, sections of Wikipedia of like uh, worthless share certificates and things like that from many yeah. companies, not just any company, automobile companies. I think there were like a hundred automobile yeah. companies at the start. Tucker. Turn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of the, at the start yeah. of the 20th century. And if there was an automobile ETF at the time, it would have been the worst. In, it would have owned all of them. That's yeah. right. It would have owned them all and it would have had the worst performance, right? So yes, automobiles reshaped our cities. They reshaped our lives. Everything about uh, uh, the way we live is changed by the car over the past hundred years how but only a handful survived. only a handful survived only a handful of people even made money on it right, right? so the, my, my view is that at least if you get the etf you're you're almost guaranteed to not go to zero right because <laughs> not everything is going to zero at That's the right. same time exactly it might take now, a couple days that right? exists that risk does exist yeah yeah and it should be it disclosed does. in yeah. the prospectus have you read the prospectus to some of these bitcoin etfs it's unbelievable oh i know they they, they you do... will lose all of your money exactly. on tuesday oh, yeah. the, the vix etfs the vix etfs <laughs> yeah. say that too yeah. the, the vix futures etfs right they say which also that. just means that they're meaningless documents you know if your document says everything is going to go horribly wrong right, then you right. have not actually informed wow. the investor of yeah, anything so, you know? so let's inject some hope back into the conversation <laughs> here right I, I think that these that's what these etfs give right, that right. it's hope right you're not going to say to somebody who buys a lottery ticket well you know that that is a negative right. present value right i mean okay uh some people do spend too much on those and do put too much hope on those things and perhaps if they had crude some savings, they'd be, do, be doing better for themselves and their family. But I think most people do realize, if they are educated properly, that even a lottery ticket is giving you some kind of utility to uh, build a narrative that, right. uh, that, has a, that has a present value to you. So long as that is happening through an efficient mechanism that has risks that are transparent and understandable, even the, the craziest moonshot ETF that's thematic in a space that's not going to have a hope of turning a profit for decades, I don't know, is something that might find a place in a certain portfolio for a very long-term investor who's kind of futuristically minded and wants to have some skin in the game, right? right? You know, uh, and now the question will be, well, there's a dozen such ETFs. Which one is best constructed? Which one has the lowest fee, right? Which one is transparently disclosing its portfolio to you most closely and honestly. Like these are things that matter and this is where our role as ETF research analysts, this is where we can come in and help people. So my question to you is what do you think of then about the feedback loop that exists between the, the markets in these kind of thematic er, uh, areas, uh, the ETFs that track them? Like for instance, I think that when ARC filed for a space ETF, there already was a space two, ETF. I think, yeah. Two, that the instant that news that ARC was going to play in that space, the inflow to those products skyrocketed. Right, because, because they assume they're going to buy those underlyings. That's right, yeah, yeah. right? So it's like the, the mere fact that an announcement for an ETF playing in a narrow niche theme caused buying, and, you know, there was, there was perhaps some people trading on the news of the ETF. The ETF itself became the news, right? right. So it's a, Well, this is certainly the case of Bitcoin. Right. I think there's no greater price driver for Bitcoin as we're recording this, yeah. then the ridiculous horse race we have in the U.S. Yeah. about whether we'll ever approve right, a spot right. one in the grayscale right. lawsuit. 
Yeah. I think Bitcoin's price is largely being determined by people betting on those outcomes, right, right. which is a little what. So, you know what? I, I love that we can go into this. I do agree that I think it's the case that I think part of the near-term bullish case for a, dem a scarce demand asset, one that has its supply algorithmically locked up, um, is uh, the, the bull case is the fact that ETF might get approved. Demand. And then there will be an influx of demand. But then what happens, right? right. Once that saturates... Is it going to be adoption? Is it going to be payments? Is it then going to leak out? Uh, uh, because everybody right? rides it for That's as long right. as they you can. Know, yeah, and then and then. I mean, that may be some of what's happened in the Canadian Bitcoin space, right? right? You had billions and billions flowed in. Some of that's come down because of obviously the price of Bitcoin coming down, but some of it's just come down naturally as well, right? Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So. You know, it's, it's something that makes me nervous. I watch it and uh, I really enjoy reading the filings right. uh, because they, they cite academic research of like spoofing and wash trades that are transparent on the blockchain, right. things like that, which, uh, you know, if you're interested in the history of financial fraud and manipulation and the history of wildcat banking in the United right. States and so on, it's, we're seeing it play out in speed, like a speed run, like a video game <laughs> speed run. Right? Yeah, uh, in exactly. real time right now. Exactly. And, and it makes it absolutely fascinating. Down to the regulatory reactions, exactly. the whole nine yards. It really right. is like a speed run of the yeah. 1800s. That's right. That's, it's, it's, I hadn't thought about it that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you, you're bullish on thematics as a class. Like, that right, you think right. that that's going to continue to explode? Like, the filings are still yeah, there. People yeah. are still so, interested. I mean, I, ha I have to temper uh, my remarks a little bit because I do think so much of the demand wave we saw for that category uh, previously was kind of a post-pandemic um, kind of uh, stimulus money response. It was a kind of, again, z uh, free money kind of uh, easing policy style uh, situation that kind of gave rise to so much of that uh, demand for these, for these themes. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't the first time we saw a, a kind of boom and bust happen within the world of, of thematic launches, right? When I started, there were shipping ETFs, there yeah, were airline right. ETFs, there was even uh, various faith share ETFs for different yeah. kind of Christian denominations, right? Different uh, kind of ESG ETFs yeah. um, that, uh, that aligned with different kinds of denominational uh, investment styles, which came and went, right? right? Uh, amazingly, right, uh, there happened to be an airline ETF right when the airlines were battered uh, at their worst when with all the travel lockdowns, right? But the earlier uh, airline ETFs had long since delisted, right? right? So uh, I think that themes are one of those kind of very cyclical uh, elements to the ETF market. They they peaked recently. They're in a trough now. They may peak again, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah all right. One, one last question then. Sure. Uh, give me a music recommendation. Oh, my one, goodness. One, one album, one song. Wow, this is, you know, Dave, of all the questions you asked, this is the one that's going to make I know me you're a music sweat guy, the though, most. We, we share am, music back and forth. I know, forth. I know, so just know we give did. Me, give me, give me, I'll, I'll go all right. first. I'll give you a pick. Uh, Please. Uh, band's called Wednesday. Song's called Quarry. Okay, Wednesday. All right. Get it on so, Spotify. Uh, I would love to give you a Canadian recommendation. Yeah. Please. Uh, but there's just too many to oh, pick from, on. you know? So I'm going to give you an Australian recommendation. Okay. It's King Gizzard and the Wizard oh. Wizard. And the album I is saw Changes. Them in Boston. Really? Four weeks ago. Oh Boston my God. Calling. They crushed they, it. They put out more albums than the rest of my playlists combined in a single I know, year. It's crazy. Uh, so my kids love them. Um, uh, you know, their album Omnium Gatherum is great. Butterfly 3000 is great. But for some reason in our house, Changes has been on, on continuous loop. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much, man. Dave. It's in you. My pleasure.